Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Ramona and Nicholas are sitting together in a cafe by a large window, drinking lattes. Ramona is eating a strawberry cake with chocolate shavings. The waiter asks if they need anything else, but the couple politely declines. Bright June sun is shining outside. Ramona and Nicholas are a happy married couple. He is a millionaire, and she is his wife. Nicholas was involved in the vending machine business, mostly consisting of coffee machines, water dispensers, and snack vending machines. They were placed all over the city, in universities, gas stations, the most profitable locations, and schools, the subway, and shopping malls. The prices at the vending machines were reasonable for both students and pensioners. Nicholas himself and his employees carefully ensured that all the machines worked flawlessly, which resulted in high demand. The first encounter between Nicholas and Ramona was amusing. Late one winter evening, Nicholas, who was 25 at the time, was returning from work. It was snowing, dark, especially when there was a considerable distance between streetlights. Suddenly, across the street on the opposite side, he saw a girl. The lamplight illuminated her. She was beautiful, tall, slender, with lush wavy chestnut hair, and a modest black coat, a matching black furry hat, and high boots. Nicholas also noticed three suspicious individuals following her. Suspicious because they were dressed in all black, with bandanas on their heads instead of hats, chains hanging around their necks, and they were grinning maliciously. Nicholas even overheard one of them say, We'll catch her now. I'm going first. The guy followed them, although he didn't think about how he, alone, would deal with three men. The girl turned the corner of a building, where there was a small courtyard with a dumpster and a narrow alley leading to another street. It was a deserted place, where usually homeless people or maniacs and rapists hung out. Nicholas heard one of the suspicious characters call the girl, asking her why she was wandering alone and how far she lived. Meanwhile, the other two accomplices started approaching the girl from different sides. Nicholas realized that these men wanted to attack her, and possibly worse, and was about to step out of his hiding place. But the girl struck the leader of the gang between his legs, causing him to fall to the ground, groaning and cursing. One of the henchmen tried to jump on the girl, but she grabbed his arm, started bending it forcefully, and then threw the man at another, knocking them both down. They hit each other in the forehead. Nicholas was amazed by the girl. Not everyone can defend themselves like that. Without realizing it, he stepped out into the light. The girl, noticing him, wanted to hit him too, but he quickly explained that he wasn't with those guys and that he was worried about her. However, the girl, seemingly not believing him, ordered him to go back home and walked away. Nicholas then noticed that she had dropped her hat during the scuffle and called after her, but she had already started running and disappeared. Nicholas, not knowing why himself, picked up the hat, realizing that the gang's leader was about to get up. He was a calm, shy guy, but before leaving, he kicked the leader in the rear, growling angrily. Act like a man, not like a pig. That's how his father taught him. Nicholas met the girl again when he came to his first fitness club session. As it turned out, her name was Ramona, and she had been involved in sports and martial arts at the same club for half a year. It became clear then how she managed to skillfully neutralize her opponents. Despite returning her hat, Ramona was not at all pleased with their encounter. Are you stalking me? She asked him irritably. In response, the guy hesitated, and she went to the treadmill. It turned out that their workout times coincided. To avoid annoying the girl and creating the illusion that he was following her, Nicholas engaged in activities that Ramona didn't. If she ran, he did push-ups. If she lifted weights, he used the stationary bike. If she was on the treadmill, he ran on the track. Nevertheless, Nicholas sometimes gazed at Ramona for a long time, but quickly lowered his eyes if she turned to him. Either she accidentally noticed him, or she felt his gaze on her. But gradually, Ramona began to get used to the young man. She took the first step, suggesting they have lunch at a nearby cafe and get to know each other better. 
Besides both of them being into sports, it turned out that they both came from modest backgrounds, had not very profitable jobs, and had a good education. After finishing university, both realized they wanted to do something else. Ramona found herself in the pastry business, and she enjoyed it very much, while Nicholas worked as an office manager, which didn't bring him much pleasure. He thought that he would gain more confidence in such a job, but in the end, it oppressed him and didn't boost his self-assurance. Nicholas was afraid on every date that Ramona would leave him. He saw many flaws in himself, he sometimes stuttered, occasionally picked the wrong words, and was generally insecure. But to his surprise, Ramona didn't turn away from him. On the contrary, she found him more interesting with each meeting. The young couple started meeting in other places besides the fitness club and cafe, on a bridge, at the movies, on excursions, and in museums. They first kissed on her birthday. Nicholas expressed all his wishes to her, told her how wonderful and beautiful she was, and how lucky he was that they had met, and then he approached and kissed her, which surprised everyone present. After that, Nicholas and Ramona began to live together, renting a one-bedroom apartment for the time being to see how they could live together. There were misunderstandings and disputes in everyday matters, but they quickly resolved them. Over time, the couple noticed changes in themselves. Nicholas became more responsible, confident, stopped stuttering, while Ramona became less aggressive and more gentle. Changes also began to take place in Nicholas's career. The company he worked for suddenly went bankrupt, and there was a serious issue with his job, especially considering that the couple was planning to get married and Nicholas didn't want to ride on Ramona's back. She came up with the idea of getting into the vending machine business. At first, Nicholas didn't like the idea, but he eventually decided to experiment with a snack vending machine. Now, whenever he had the chance, Nicholas thanked Ramona for the idea. He acquired several more vending machines for water and coffee. Over time, the number of machines increased, along with their income. Nicholas had employees who also took care of the machine's maintenance and replenishment. After their business started to thrive, Nicholas proposed to Ramona. They had a lavish and unforgettable wedding. Ramona shone in her white, voluminous dress and a long veil. A large wedding cake with figurines of the bride and groom on top was served, and a heart-shaped lock was attached to the bridge. The newlyweds then spent their honeymoon in the Maldives, where every day was sunny, and the nights were magical. The couple purchased a three-bedroom apartment in a skyscraper in the city center with an electronic fireplace, a small bar in the kitchen, large windows, and a view of the city. With Nicholas's income, they could travel to any country and stay in five-star hotels. Everyone loves comfort. However, Ramona didn't quit her job as a pastry chef. She didn't want to be idle. The couple developed their own travel traditions. In winter, they went skiing in Italy, France, Austria, or Switzerland, and in summer, they went to the sea in Turkey, India, or Australia. Despite becoming millionaires, Nicholas and Ramona remained humble, did not take things for granted, and treated other people with humanity because they understood that wealth doesn't come easily. They even donated significant sums to orphans and cancer patients. Since both Nicholas and Ramona were working, they hired only one housekeeper, Ines, a cute blonde with curly hair. She also took care of the house when the couple went abroad or when Ramona was unwell. Unfortunately, Ramona fell ill quite often, which was surprising given her continued involvement in sports. So once a year, the couple went to various sanatoriums together. Nicholas didn't want to leave his wife alone. Natalia, Nicholas's mother-in-law, adored him, rejoiced in what a wonderful husband her daughter had found, and joked that no one would have married her Mona with her character. Nicholas liked Natalia for her cheerful nature and activity. Despite her age, she looked attractive and was involved in sports. Unfortunately, Nicholas didn't have a chance to meet his father-in-law Flavio, as he passed away long before he met Ramona. Nicholas, sipping his latte, was looking at his colleague's work reports when suddenly Ramona's voice distracted him from his thoughts. His wife reminded him that they had been married for four years, they had a spacious apartment, a good salary that provided them with new opportunities each year, and soon Ramona would turn 30. Perhaps it was time to think about starting a family. 
Mentally, Nicholas knew that such a question would arise someday. But despite his growing confidence with age and all the reasons Ramona listed, the young man didn't feel ready for the role of a father. He knew and saw that this role was demanding, serious, and round the clock, unlike that of a theater or film actor who could take at least one day off. With children, it wouldn't work out, especially when they were still little. Ramona's illnesses hadn't disappeared and were a concern for the couple. Nicholas didn't want to risk his wife's health, which he reminded her of. Therefore, he suggested postponing the question of having children for now, which disappointed Ramona a bit. Still, when it came to her health, her husband was right, so she put the matter on hold. Several months later, the spouses organized a charity ball at one of the city's clubs. The money raised would go towards the treatment of cancer patients. Nicholas and Ramona waltzed in the center of the hall. Everyone was captivated by both the ball and the couple's dance. Nicholas thanked everyone present and added that if it weren't for his wife, Ramona, none of this would have happened. He expressed his gratitude to her for being his inspiration and kissed his wife amidst applause. This speech and this kiss became a tradition for Nicholas. He did the same at any event they organized with his wife, and one might think it was insincere due to the repetition. However, Nicholas was always sincere. He genuinely appreciated Ramona for everything he had and had no reservations about expressing it. Late one evening, when the spouses returned home, Ramona was in a cheerful mood and wanted to talk about having a child again. But Nicholas, despite being content himself, was very tired and wanted to sleep. So she decided to save this conversation for tomorrow. Little did she know what the next day would bring. In the morning, as always, the couple sat at the table near the window for breakfast, which consisted of omelets and ham. Ramona brought up the topic of having a child, causing Nicholas to nearly choke on his food. He immediately asked if she was pregnant. Ramona was surprised by her beloved husband's reaction and told him that she wasn't pregnant but thought it was time for them to become parents. Ramona shouldn't have broached this topic because Nicholas was mentally exhausted. One of his vending machines in a university had malfunctioned and the preparation for and execution of the charity ball had drained him. Now, his beloved wife was talking about children who required constant attention, feeding, dressing, teaching, and upbringing, not to mention the financial responsibility. This was a long-term issue. Unlike dealing with a vending machine, you make sure it works, check how much money it has, and forget about it. A child required constant care, and for the first time in their relationship, Nicholas yelled at his wife. He was angry because he hadn't had time to recover himself, and she was already thinking about children who demanded attention all the time, not to mention their incessant crying. In the end, he told Ramona, in anger, that if she wanted to spend time with children so badly, she should go work at a daycare. Nicholas didn't finish his breakfast, hastily got dressed for work, and left the apartment, slamming the door behind him, which startled Ines, who had just arrived. He also forgot the lunch that his wife had prepared for him and placed in a special container. Ramona, scared by her husband's tone and outburst, burst into tears. Ines immediately brought her some water to calm her down. Nicholas's words had hurt Ramona deeply, and she was upset about the situation. She wondered why she inspired and supported him in everything, and he responded with such anger to a simple suggestion. After all, she wasn't even pregnant. And in the end, he had his own business, plenty of money, apartments, and a car. Why couldn't they have a child? For years of marriage. How much longer could they put it off? Was he still afraid of responsibility? Ramona went to work feeling very sad and disconnected, and her boss scolded her for being late. He remarked that she was the wife of a millionaire, but should not forget her duties. It was a truly bad start to her day. On the way to work in the car, Nicholas had cooled down and now regretted yelling at Ramona. He understood perfectly well that a parent's life involves children's cries and diaper changes. However, it's just a phase, and he still didn't want kids. What if everything that's going well for them now takes a turn for the worse during Ramona's pregnancy? He had heard too many unpleasant stories about businesses going under during such times. 
And why put Ramona through this stress, especially considering her health? No, it was too early to have children, but he definitely needed to apologize to his wife. At work, Nicholas forgot about the argument for several hours and only remembered it when it was time to head home. So, he bought violets, which Ramona loved, and a strawberry cake, one of her favorites, and headed home, thinking about the right words to use for his apology. In the evening, when she returned home, Ramona felt unwell. She attributed it to work exhaustion, as she had received many orders that week, in addition to the charity ball and the morning argument with her husband. However, after taking a shower, she began to feel nauseated, and her legs were barely supporting her. Weakness overcame her completely. She went to the kitchen but couldn't prepare food, so she lay down on the couch. Ines noticed her condition and gave her some water. At that moment, a contented Nicholas returned home, ready to deliver his speech, but when he saw his wife's condition, he quickly measured her temperature, which was very high. For a moment, Nicholas thought it might be a symptom of pregnancy. A few days ago, they had had a wonderful night and contraception could fail. However, Ramona's condition looked painful and alarming. Nicholas put Ramona to bed, and Ines called a doctor who could help her. The doctor, around 40 years old, was named Gregory Oyos, almost like a character from the house TV serials. After carefully examining Ramona, the doctor told Nicholas that it definitely wasn't pregnancy, but that the most frightening thing was that he didn't know what was wrong with his wife. Senor Oyos prescribed some antibiotics and recommended that Ramona observe bed rest. He also advised Nicholas to sleep in a different place to avoid potential infection. The doctor promised to find a cure. Ines took charge of the household chores around the apartment. By the time the doctor left, the violets that Nicholas had bought, which had been left without water, had withered, so Nicholas discarded them. He then went to the room to apologize to his wife. Ramona was feeling better and accepted her husband's apology. She agreed with a bitter laugh that thinking about children right now was completely irrelevant. Nicholas chuckled and felt relieved that his wife was no longer upset with him and the peace was restored. He wished her a speedy recovery, mentioned that her favorite cake awaited her, and kissed her hand. In response, she tousled his hair, a gesture she used to show her support. The next day, Nicholas inquired about whether anyone with similar symptoms had been admitted to the hospital. He thought Ramona might have been poisoned at the ball, but this theory proved false. No one, neither the guests nor the waitstaff, had been hospitalized. Nobody got sick, which meant Ramona's illness was unique to her. The doctor came every day, brought new medicines to check their effect on Ramona, but they barely helped. Ramona was wasting away, her skin turned pale, and her hair lost its shine. She lay in bed all the time. Fortunately, Ines was nearby. She purposely stayed overnight at her employer's apartment and performed her duties. She changed Ramona's pillow position, brought her food, helped her change or get to the bathroom, tidied up the apartment, and prepared all the breakfasts, lunches, and dinners for Nicholas. But Ramona's unfortunate husband, who slept on the large sofa in the living room, still missed his wife's homemade cutlets, potatoes, chicken, pork, salmon, or sweets, and most importantly, her smile, her embraces, and her kisses. It was so frustrating that all of this happened right after their argument. They had to tell Ramona's mother about her illness because she fell ill two days before Natalia's birthday. Her mother canceled the celebration and visited her daughter every day, calling Nicholas to inquire about her condition. One day, Natalia arrived just as the doctor was conducting another examination of the patient, and she got very angry with him. Why couldn't he find a remedy for her girl? It had been five days since Ramona fell ill. Senor Oyos claimed that he was thoroughly studying the disease, searching for similarities with others, and had already written about the disease to colleagues in other hospitals. Natalia was not convinced. She asked Nicholas if he could find another doctor or send Ramona to the hospital. However, Senor Oyos asked her not to do that and told Natalia in an offended tone that he was a Nobel laureate and the disease was serious, requiring careful examination. Nicholas also reassured his mother-in-law, noting that Senor Oyos was already coming to their home every day. I don't like him, 
He has an evil eye, Natalia said quietly, reproaching Nicholas. On the seventh day of Ramona's illness, Nicholas entered her room to wish her a good morning. He always did this to uplift Ramona's spirits. His wife was still asleep, her face frozen with sadness and pain. Nicholas, while continuing to talk to Ramona, took her hand, but it turned out to be cold and lifeless. Refusing to believe the worst, Nicholas began to shake Ramona, calling her. His voice turned into a shout, tears streamed from his eyes, but his wife did not react. Ines, who had been frightened by the shouting, rushed in and saw everything. She covered her mouth with both hands, understanding what had happened. Nicholas cried for half an hour. Ines had already called for an ambulance, and then the grief-stricken millionaire called Natalia. When his mother-in-law said over the phone, Hello, Nico. How is Ramona? Nicholas could only let out a groan and an inarticulate sound, and Natalia understood everything and began to cry, with Nicholas joining her. Ramona died at the age of just 29. Nicholas and Natalia sat together in the corridor. They were in the morgue, waiting for the autopsy results, wanting to know why Ramona had died. The chief pathologist came out of the office with the results in hand and a somewhat surprised expression on his face. He said that in his practice, this was the first such case. The autopsy showed that Ramona had a new type of cancer, a mixture of leukemia and pneumonia. Shocked, Natalia asked how this could happen, as their daughter had been to a sanatorium and had been involved in sports and martial arts. The pathologist sadly replied that a healthy lifestyle was not always a guarantee of a long life. He gave an example of a woman who never ate fast food or sweets but died at the age of 40. Then he began to explain how Ramona's illness had developed. Nicholas barely listened to him. He didn't even understand how he ended up here. The world seemed blurry to him, like through a poorly cleaned window, like in the eyes of someone with severely impaired vision. Ramona, his Ramona, was no more with him. At some point, his legs gave out, and he would have fallen to the floor if Natalia and the pathologist had not been there. Nicholas, as if in a drunken state, squeezed out that he wanted to see Ramona. And in turn, a young man suddenly called the pathologist, and he left the room, asking them to wait. Five minutes later, he returned and allowed them to see Ramona. Looking at the white, emaciated body of the young woman, Natalia wiped her reddened eyes with a handkerchief. Nicholas wanted to kneel beside his wife, hug her, cry, but he held back. Wise people say that men don't cry. Only a few people gathered at the funeral, Natalia, Nicholas's parents, relatives, and friends of the spouses, or rather the widower and the deceased. Ramona was dressed in her favorite dress, white with a violet hem, ruffles, and shoulder straps. Thanks to the efforts of the funeral home staff, her hair looked voluminous and shiny. Nicholas couldn't help but think that even dead Ramona looked beautiful, or rather, like she was sleeping rather than dead. Something inside the man consoled him, told him that Ramona would wake up and say, Nick, everything is fine, I'm alive. Then sorrow would turn into joy, Nicholas would lift her up, whirl her around, just like on their wedding day, and they would go celebrate together. Nick, how she loved it when his wife called him Nick or Nicky. He would never hear that name again, never hear her jokes and sarcasm, her beautiful voice, there would be no strong shoulder by his side, no words of support and comfort. Suddenly, Nicholas thought that he had paid little attention to his wife's desires, that he had not supported her enough. He kissed Ramona on her cold lips, hoping it would wake her up like Snow White or Sleeping Beauty. But nothing happened, they were not in a fairy tale. Nicholas's hope that Ramona would wake up now was completely shattered when they closed the lid of the coffin and began to lower it into the grave. A mound formed, and flowers were placed next to it. People started to leave, only Nicholas remained by the grave, looking at his wife's name, date of birth and death engraved on the stone. She left too soon, and the world became indifferent to him again. He didn't want to go home, especially since no one was waiting for him there. Natalia was already getting ready to leave. Before leaving, she said to her son-in-law, Nico, I think it's time to let her go. For the first time, Nicholas truly became angry with his mother-in-law. And is this what my wife's mother says? 
but he kept silent despite his emotions. He stood by the grave for some more time, then walked away and remembered how he and Ramona went skiing in Italy. On the first day, Ramona humorously, as she put it, fell. She lay on the snow on her stomach, her feet in skis, her hands folded like a cat, and she suffered no injuries. It did indeed look funny from the side, and they took a photo to remember it. He remembered how they swam on an inflatable mattress in Turkey, and then Nicholas, apparently, got into an awkward position, and the mattress flipped over, and the spouses ended up in the water, laughing for a long time. He recalled their honeymoon in the Maldives, where they enjoyed diving together, observing marine fish and animals, their cozy little house, and their beautiful wedding. He remembered their first meeting at the fitness club. Nicholas felt a sense of fear. How would he return to the apartment? How would he work? Even during Ramona's illness, he couldn't concentrate at work, and now he had no desire to deal with his business at all. How would he live on alone, completely alone? And you wanted children, he thought. He had postponed the question of children indefinitely, had yelled at his wife, and now he was being punished by fate, condemned to complete loneliness. Leaving the cemetery, Nicholas saw a gypsy woman. A slender woman in a purple and black dress with lush black hair tied with a band from which golden coins dangled. Like all beggars, she begged for as much as people could give, promising to bring luck. Nicholas, in a state of apathy, took out a large banknote from his wallet and indifferently handed it to the gypsy woman. Nicholas, Nick, stop, someone called him. It was that gypsy. When asked what she wanted, the gypsy woman beckoned him over and asked him to sit down. Nicholas reluctantly squatted in front of her, and the gypsy woman explained that she was a fortune teller and was willing to help him in return for his kindness. Nicholas was about to leave, but the gypsy woman told him that she knew about his grief. He had just buried his beloved wife. You saw me at the cemetery and by the grave. That's obvious. But then the gypsy woman suddenly said that he was involved in the vending business, described the dress in which Ramona was buried, said that she fell ill, and for some reason, the doctor couldn't find a cure for her for a week, which was suspicious. Nicholas was amazed at the gypsy woman's knowledge. Son, she said, all your misfortunes have arisen because of your competitors. You didn't want to cooperate with them, so they decided to destroy you through your wife, not with their own hands, but through doctors and your maid Ines. She had been harboring ill will toward your wife for a long time, just pretending sweet. But most importantly, your Ramona is alive. Hurry to her. I feel that she's struggling to breathe. Nicholas, as if under the spell of some enchantment, ran back to his wife's grave. In his soul, there was a storm of emotions, shock, confusion, and happiness that Ramona was alive, and the gypsy woman somehow knew it. And she knew so many things that were hard to guess. The gypsy woman was right about the competitors. Nicholas had them, like any successful entrepreneur. But he wasn't the only one in the vending business. His competitors, Senor De Monte and Senor Melgosa, both around 40 years old, dressed impeccably, drove expensive cars with personal drivers. They offered Nicholas cooperation, arguing that all three of them would make more profit together. However, Nicholas and Ramona discovered that these gentlemen were irresponsible in their approach to business. The prices on their vending machines were inflated, and customers often complained about it. Approximately once a month, the machines would malfunction and customers would find out during use when they had already inserted their money. Not only did their vending machines not enjoy high demand, but they also received complaints. Nicholas realized that Senor De Monte and Senor Melgosa simply wanted to benefit from a young specialist without doing anything. Ramona even suspected that they would probably take 80% of the profit, if not the entire 100%. Nicholas refused to collaborate with them. However, this did not deter the competitors. They continued to insist, arguing that small businesses could collapse at any moment. Nicholas didn't give in, and the competitors started demanding cooperation, even resorting to threats, saying that if he didn't collaborate with them, they would make sure that the sanitary inspection became interested in his machines. Fortunately, the sanitary inspection didn't help the competitors in this case. 
Nicholas had everything in order, clean, and with a license. Once, a few of Nicholas's machines were sabotaged. Security cameras recorded suspicious individuals in black clothing breaking the machines. The day after the vandalism, both competitors came to Nicholas's office, claiming they had heard about his misfortune and asked if he had reconsidered cooperation with them, saying they were willing to extend a helping hand. But Nicholas didn't get scared, even though the sabotage of the machines led to financial losses. He sternly informed the competitors that he knew about their actions, and this only solidified his belief that he couldn't collaborate with them. Ramona was also in the office and, in her delicate manner, escorted the gentleman out the door. She grabbed both of them by the ears and led them to the office door, telling them not to set foot in their company again, or else she would speak to them in a friendly manner. They decided to destroy you through your wife. And, apparently, to take personal revenge on her as well. There were many witnesses to that scene, and everyone was chuckling. It was outrageous for a young woman to lead two grown men out of the office by the ears. Moreover, at all events where there were many people and cameras, Nicholas publicly declared his love for his wife, acknowledging how much he owed her. This was something the competitors couldn't ignore either. By the way, at one of the events long before the vending machine sabotage, these competitors shamelessly showed up uninvited, offering cooperation once again. They paid compliments to Ramona, which she didn't like. It was then that the competitors strongly hinted to Nicholas that if his wife were to leave him or, worse, something bad were to happen to her. Nicholas, fed up with their proposals, nearly lost his temper, and it was only because of the presence of others that he asked the competitors to leave and not create a scene. Apparently, when it came to his wife, they had decided to turn their words into actions. The gypsy woman was also right about Ines. When she first started working for Nicholas and Ramona, she had a good working relationship with the employer's wife, which might have seemed like friendship at first. However, in Ramona's absence, Ines tried to show Nicholas signs of affection, sending him loving glances, blowing kisses, winking, and occasionally wearing revealing clothing. Nicholas noticed this, but didn't give in to her advances. When she openly tried to embrace him, he firmly made it clear to her that he would not cheat on his wife and threatened to reveal what a treacherous friend she was. Ines was frightened back then, apologized profusely, and Nicholas, perhaps unwisely, decided not to fire her. She had been sharpening her teeth against your wife for a long time. Only now, as he returned to his wife's grave, did he remember that Ines had suggested calling Nicholas, and it was she who had taken great care of the sick Ramona, including delivering food to her in bed. Perhaps she had been adding something to her food. Then Nicholas remembered the Nobel laureate doctor who had come to their home every day with various medications. Could it have been something else? He hadn't heeded Natalia's disapproval of the doctor at the time, who had said, I don't like him, he has an evil eye. How unfortunate that he hadn't listened to her then and called another doctor. Nicholas had already reached Ramona's grave and called the gravediggers, instructing them to immediately open the grave. At first, they were surprised, thinking that the young man had gone mad with grief and was saying nonsense. But Nicholas raised his voice in anger and desperation, even grabbing a shovel to start digging himself. The gravediggers joined in, knowing that he was young but a millionaire and could potentially cause them harm, like getting them fired, and they didn't want that. When they reached the coffin, they heard some murmuring and moaning. Nicholas lifted the lid himself and saw Ramona with wide open eyes, mumbling something. Tears streaming down his face, he pulled his wife out of the coffin and embraced her tightly. But then he remembered that she needed air and sat her on the edge of the grave, not caring about either his or her clothing. He started stroking her head and shoulder, trying to calm her down. Ramona was coughing and simultaneously gasping for air. The gravediggers, who had heard stories of ghosts and resurrected corpses, were in shock, but one of them realized they needed to call an ambulance. An hour and a half later, the ambulance was parked at the cemetery entrance and doctors examined Ramona. They found signs of shock and mild asphyxiation. If Nicholas hadn't arrived in time, she would have surely died. 
reporters and journalists had also arrived, eager to capture the extraordinary story of Ramona's resurrection, but Nicholas chased them away, saying that he wasn't ready to comment and that his wife needed help. As the spouses rode in the ambulance, Ramona, who had somewhat regained her senses, told Nicholas that she had woken up in the morgue and tried to call for him, but the young intern had called the pathologist and he had injected something into her, causing her to fall asleep again. She woke up in the coffin when they were burying her, but Nicholas had saved her just in time. He had already informed Natalia that Ramona was alive and, naturally, she didn't believe it at first. However, when she heard her daughter's faint voice, she burst into tears of joy. Nicholas asked his mother-in-law not to tell anyone about Ramona's resurrection. However, it was already useless. Reporters and journalists had already filmed and recorded everything. Most likely, all the TVs and newspapers would be covering the story tomorrow. In the hospital, doctors found a substance in Ramona's blood that slows down the heart's function and, consequently, blood circulation, leading to the cooling and immobilization of the body, and a person goes into a kind of lethargic sleep, like the drink in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, only dangerous to health, almost like poison. Ramona had been given this substance in small doses over a long period, so it didn't take effect instantly, but after a week. When the chief physician of the hospital, Sonora Iniesta, looked at the autopsy report, she was, to put it mildly, surprised. This is the fantasy of a fool. Your wife has no cancer, and she never did, said the chief physician. Your wife's body is somewhat weakened, but with her lifestyle, it can be overcome. Nicholas remembered Ramona's words about something like a sedative being injected into her in the morgue. Could the pathologist also be involved here, thought the young millionaire angrily. The gypsy had mentioned both Ines and the doctors. A delighted Natalia arrived at the hospital, but they didn't allow her to see her daughter. Ramona was still in the intensive care unit, and they needed to make sure that there were no traces of the substance left in her, especially considering she had been nearly buried alive. Natalia began hugging and kissing Nicholas. I told you, my daughter is lucky to have you. How did you know that Mona was alive? He replied with a smile. One good gypsy helped. Nicholas returned home with a great calmness. Ines still didn't know anything and greeted him with sympathetic looks. In response, he just nodded. Although during dinner, she tried to be affectionate and embrace Nicholas, he pushed her away. Ignorant of everything, Ines attributed it to grief after his wife's death. In reality, Nicholas wanted nothing more than to strangle Ines for her hypocrisy and duplicity. Ramona had always spoken so highly of her, considered her a friend, and yet she had almost sent her to the afterlife. The young millionaire also realized that he needed to catch the culprits and conspirators involved in poisoning Ramona, but he had no evidence, only the gypsy's predictions, which were unlikely to be taken seriously by anyone. However, grounds for legal action could be the false autopsy report and Ramona's statements about waking up in the morgue with something injected into her. The next morning, the news reported Ramona's return from the afterlife. Ines was so shocked that she dropped her plates. Pretending to be bewildered, Nicholas asked her why she was so surprised. Ines mumbled that she was in shock from Ramona's resurrection and asked why he hadn't told her yesterday. Nicholas replied that he didn't want unnecessary commotion, that he was very tired from the numerous events of the previous day, and he also made a comment to Ines his wife had just returned from the other side and she was already trying to seduce him for the second time. Ines turned red and started drilling the floor with her eyes, but Nicholas noticed the anger in her gaze. She reluctantly apologized to her employer, explaining her behavior by saying she just wanted to comfort him and let him know he wasn't alone. Beautiful words, Nicholas thought and pretended to forgive her. After breakfast, Nicholas went to the cemetery in hopes of finding the gypsy and expressing his gratitude for saving his wife. He also wanted to ask her if she could provide testimony to the police. Perhaps she could convince the investigators of her foresight, just as she had convinced him. Son, no one will believe me except you, and I've helped as much as I could, said the gypsy. But my final advice to you is not to leave your wife alone, even in the hospital, the hunt for both of you continues. 
Nicholas accepted her advice and, before leaving, asked for her name so he could remember her with kind words. The gypsy, smiling, replied, My name is Zemphira. While Nicholas was driving to the hospital to see his wife, he received a call from an unknown number. He initially ignored it, but the caller turned out to be very persistent. Nicholas angrily answered the call but softened when the caller introduced himself as Bernardo, a young intern from the morgue, and mentioned having important information about his wife. Nicholas suggested meeting at the entrance to the hospital where Ramona was admitted, and the young man agreed. When the young millionaire arrived, Bernardo was already there. I realized that your wife was alive back in the morgue. I saw her breathing, and I called my boss, and he came in, grabbed some kind of injection, and administered it to her. I asked him, what are you doing? And he said, quiet, you didn't see anything. And if you tell anyone, I'll make it look like you committed malpractice during your internship, and then not only will you fail, but you'll also get kicked out of the university. I was afraid, so I stayed quiet. But when I saw that your wife had come back to life, I decided to tell everything. It's just inhuman. Nicholas praised the young man for his bravery and assured him that he would do everything to get him reinstated at the university. He then asked him to accompany him and provide a statement to the police. At the police station, Nicholas filed a report. The investigators took into account the false autopsy report, Sonora Iniesta's conclusion about poisoning, Ramona's statements, and Bernardo's testimony. Additionally, a forensic expert verified the diagnosis given by the pathologist on the internet and confirmed that there was no such cancer as the one Ramona was alleged to have. Nicholas, two police officers, and Bernardo then drove to the morgue. They knocked on the pathologist's office door, but there was silence, and although the secretary downstairs said he should be in there, the office was empty and the window was open. Bernardo suddenly disappeared. The men realized that the pathologist had decided to flee and rushed outside. Bernardo, as it turned out, was ahead of them, ran around the building, and managed to knock the pathologist down. However, the pathologist got up, pulled out a scalpel, and cut Bernardo's hand. He was about to aim for his neck when the police officers apprehended him. The doctor's escape was deemed resistance to a public official in the line of duty, as well as a deliberate assault causing bodily harm to a young man. The pathologist was forced to confess that Senor De Monte and Senor Melgosa had paid him to issue a false diagnosis for Ramona and ensure that she did not wake up. When asked where he got the substance found in Ramona's blood, he claimed that Senor Oyos, a doctor who had been treating Ramona, had given it to him. At that moment, Nicholas remembered the gypsy's admonition to stay with Ramona and asked to leave to be with his wife. The police officers released him and assured him that they would handle the pathologist, Senor Oyos, and the other conspirators themselves. Meanwhile, in Ramona's room, Natalia was sitting by her side. Ramona herself was asleep, recuperating from her ordeal and procedures, then Natalia left the room and didn't notice as a doctor entered, concealing his face under a mask. He approached Ramona, took out a syringe and a vial containing a suspicious liquid, filled the syringe with it, and was about to inject it into Ramona when suddenly Nicholas burst into the room, fearing for his wife. The young millionaire immediately demanded an explanation from the stranger about who he was and what he intended to do to his wife. The stranger began explaining that he simply wanted to give Ramona an injection. Both his voice and appearance, despite the mask, seemed familiar to Nicholas. Senor Oyos, is that you? Asked Nicholas. Shock was evident in the stranger's eyes. He tried to lie, saying that he didn't know any Senor Oyos, but Nicholas was no fool. He understood everything and demanded the syringe. At that moment, Natalia returned and witnessed this scene. Senor Oyos tried to make a run for the door, but Nicholas grabbed his hand and began to twist it, just as Ramona had taught him. Meanwhile, Natalia, realizing the identity of the intruder, reached into her bag and pulled out a rolling pin, which she forcefully struck against the doctor's forehead, causing him to collapse to the floor. Nicholas, barely containing his amusement, asked if she had been carrying the rolling pin with her all this time. I wanted to find that scoundrel and give him a peace of mind. 
Since I didn't know where he was, I decided to carry it with me. Besides, I need to protect my daughter. They tried to poison her, replied Natalia. Nicholas chuckled and called the police. At the police station, Senor Oyos confessed that he had been paid by Nicholas's competitors to administer poison to Ramona and cover up the true cause of her illness. The actual poison had not been used, but he had found an alternative substance that had a detrimental effect on the body. Unfortunately for the doctor, this substance had been banned for any purpose and was subject to confiscation. Senor Oyos had made a deal with Ines, Nicholas's housekeeper. She was supposed to add the substance to Ramona's food, while Senor Oyos used simple antibiotics to slow down Ramona's recovery and hasten her death. However, it seemed that Ramona's body was much stronger than he and Nicholas's competitors had anticipated. Despite the fact that she had suffered from various illnesses throughout her life, the substance didn't kill her, it only weakened her body and plunged her into a deep sleep. The syringe he had intended to use on Ramona in the hospital actually contained real poison. And here's a Nobel Prize laureate, thought Nicholas, as he watched Senor Oyos being struck with the rolling pin by his mother-in-law. In her apartment, Ines hastily packed her belongings into a suitcase. Despite her belief that her employer hadn't suspected anything, she decided to flee the capital, especially since Ramona had awakened and Senor de Monte and Senor Melgosa hadn't paid her anything and refused to help her. Ramona was supposed to die. You didn't fulfill your part of the agreement, so you won't get anything, they told her. She had to rely on herself now. Ines had already rushed out onto the street with her suitcase when Nicholas appeared before her, asking how far she planned to go. He noticed the fear in her expression, and she quickly replied that she was leaving for a few days to visit relatives. Nicholas decided not to expose the ruse, telling her that he knew everything. Ines pushed him and tried to run, but with a suitcase, it was challenging. Nicholas grabbed Ines, and she, like a little child, began to kick, bite, and scream that he wouldn't prove anything. The doctor gave you away, Nicholas jerked her cruelly. Then two police officers arrived and handcuffed Ines. At the police station, Ines confessed that Nicholas's competitors had offered her a high-paying position. She had agreed. This made Nicholas furious, and he paid her so little that she had betrayed him and found a suitable doctor for poisoning. Senor Oyos turned out to be a family friend. Ines had long wanted to get rid of Ramona in the hope that Nicholas would then belong to her. However, when he didn't reciprocate her feelings, she decided to seek revenge for his ill treatment and eliminate her rival. As Ines was being led to the cell, Nicholas promised her that she would experience real ill treatment in prison. Victor Afanasievich and Senor Melgoso were apprehended, one at the airport, trying to flee to another country, the other right in his office, also hastily preparing to leave. They attempted to bribe the police, but it didn't help. Several people had informed on them, the housekeeper Ines, the doctor, and the pathologist. During questioning, the businessmen admitted that Nicholas's business was so profitable that after unsuccessful attempts to collaborate with him, they decided to poison his wife because they knew he would be devastated by her death, which might finally force him to join them. To achieve their goal, they bribed the doctor, the housekeeper, the pathologist, and even some employees of the funeral home to make sure Ramona didn't wake up. They admitted that they had been annoyed by Senor Oyos's idea of using a slow-acting poison. They wanted things to proceed more quickly, but ultimately their plan failed. Victor Afanasievich and Senor Melgosa received life sentences, while Senor Oyos and the pathologist received 25 years in prison. Ines, on the other hand, had somewhat better luck. After all, she was a woman, but she wouldn't see freedom for the next 10 years. Nicholas made sure that his beloved wife was no longer in danger and returned to the place where he had first met Zemfira. However, to his disappointment, the gypsy woman was not there. He wanted not only to thank her, but also to help her with work and housing, with anything, just to ensure that she lacked nothing. Zemfira might be a beggar, but she was a good person. Nicholas called out to her, but there was no response. The young millionaire stood there for about 10 minutes, looking around and calling for the gypsy woman several more times, but she still didn't appear. Finally, Nicholas headed home. 
but right at the moment he turned away from the cemetery, he felt how something knocked the ground behind him. It was a small rock wrapped in a paper note, which said, You're welcome, Nikki. Ramona returned home happily. After so many unpleasant incidents, it was such a relief to be back home. Nicholas waited for a few days for his wife to recover, calm down, and relax in her own bed, in her own apartment. He even took on the cooking. He forbade her to go to work. Once, Ramona's dissatisfied boss called her from the confectionery, wanting to know when she would arrive. And he knew that she had first died and then come back to life. Nicholas took the phone and calmly, but sternly, told the confectioner, If you continue speaking to my wife in such a tone, I will have a private conversation with you in the same manner. The confectioner immediately lost his desire to call Ramona and express any dissatisfaction. Then Nicholas sat his wife on the couch and began showing her photos of a small cottage in another town. The house itself was ready for occupancy, but it lacked furniture, heating, water, and gas. Its previous owners had furnished it, but later decided to leave it in such a state and put it up for sale. Nicholas suggested that this cottage could become their new home if Ramona approved. Ramona was surprised. Why all this? To which Nicholas replied that he wanted to leave this city to forget it, and he even planned to sell his business due to recent events. It hurt him deeply that people they trusted had gone to such lengths for money and engaged in such a sinister plot. He didn't want to live in a place where everyone could be bought. Ramona supported her husband and agreed with all his decisions, including the choice of the house. A contented Nicholas then showed her a room in the house with a large window and a balcony, which, he said, would belong to their child. Initially, it would be a nursery, and then they would renovate it as their child grew. Ramona was momentarily taken aback, thinking that her ears were playing tricks on her. Nick is willing to become a father? He confirmed. Yes, I'm ready for fatherhood. I understand that it will be challenging, especially given our move. But we're together, and you know, as strange as it may sound, the only thing I'm thanking Lord for is that poisoning, so now I'll cherish every moment spent with you. I don't want to lose you again. Tears of happiness welled up in Ramona's eyes, and she hugged and kissed her husband tightly. Nicholas sold his business when a new home with Ramona was fully furnished and ready for occupancy. The couple organized a farewell dinner with Nicholas's employees. They regretted losing their employer as they had become friends over the years. However, they didn't try to dissuade him from his decision. Alongside setting up their new home, Nicholas found a job in the new city and Ramona, in addition to making confectionery at home, took on remote work. The couple moved into their new home and their new life began. The place was cozy and beautiful. Outside the windows, there was a lush green forest with occasional rays of sunlight filtering through the trees. Occasionally, they spotted squirrels or hedgehogs on the lawn. Nicholas thought it was better to look at this landscape than at skyscrapers in the city. In the evening, the happy couple settled comfortably on the couch by the fireplace. Nicholas gently stroked Ramona's belly. She was already four months pregnant. Everything will be fine, Nicholas thought. Several years later, Ramona and Nicholas sat on the veranda. Their little girl was playing with a ball on the lawn, and then she asked her parents if she could walk around the village. Nicholas went with her, as his work allowed for it. It was remote work with a flexible schedule. Ramona smiled affectionately as she watched both of them and gently caressed her belly. She was pregnant with their second child, hoping this time for a boy. Everything turned out not to be as frightening as Nicholas had feared. Ramona's pregnancy progressed smoothly, she gave birth on time, and, surprisingly, her health improved, and she fell ill less often. There were a few sleepless months, but that phase passed. Natalia harbored a deep affection for her granddaughter despite the distance. She visited her daughter and son-in-law frequently and even planned to move closer to her family in the same city. She had grown tired of the old town as well. The lives of the couple had changed somewhat without their business, although their wealth wasn't as substantial as before, they were far from impoverished. Most importantly, they were alive and healthy, and no one threatened them anymore. 
Due to the birth of their daughter, they had to put international travel on hold for about three years, but then this tradition resumed. In Italy, they put their daughter on skis to learn how to ski, just like her parents. Soon, she would attend a school located not far from their home. It was a small school, but the locals spoke highly of it, and the girl had already made friends in the city. They named their daughter Zemfira. Ramona knew about the gypsy who had saved her with her fortune telling and regretted not being able to meet her again. The couple decided to name their child in her honor so they would always remember her. Nicholas walked behind his daughter, who was jumping and dancing along the road. He momentarily got distracted by a message on his phone, and when he looked up, he saw Zemfira talking to an unfamiliar woman sitting by the road, who appeared to be a homeless woman. Worried for his daughter, Nicholas hurried over to her. He was surprised when he saw the woman his daughter was conversing with. Allow me to introduce you to my namesake, Zemfira, the gypsy, chuckled. She hadn't changed over the years, the same black, voluminous hair, a beautiful figure, the same dresses, and a headband with coins. Nicholas asked her about her life, to which the gypsy replied that she couldn't complain. She had come to this city because in the old town, they started driving away and capturing gypsies, supposedly for robberies and theft. She remarked that he had done the right thing by leaving. Things are getting nasty there, she added. I wanted to find you and help with housing and work, Nicholas began. No, son. I don't need anything. You've already repaid me enough, the gypsy replied. With a gesture, she indicated towards the little girl. Besides, we gypsies are free people, constantly traveling. Our work is dancing and entertaining people. I have what I need. And you? She asked Nicholas, although, as a seer, she already knew the answer. Nicholas smiled as he looked at his child and replied, Yes. The gypsy nodded approvingly. Zemfira, daughter, who had been listening to their conversation, asked her father if he knew the lady. Nicholas explained that she had once saved her mother's life, which delighted the little girl, especially when she realized that they had the same names. She hugged the woman, who responded with tenderness and warmth. Nicholas invited the gypsy to come to their home, especially since his wife wanted to meet her. The woman accompanied them to the gate, but didn't go further into their yard out of courtesy. Nicholas called his wife, and Ramona was delighted to meet the gypsy, thanking her for saving her life. Later, Nicholas and his daughter entered the house, while the gypsy, winking at Ramona, quietly told her that she would give birth to a boy. Ramona was overjoyed. Nicholas insisted that the gypsy join them for a meal, and she agreed. During the meal, little Zemfira asked if she could become a gypsy, which elicited laughter from everyone. Zemfira, the gypsy, gently explained to her that there was nothing fun about it. There was hardly any food, limited housing, and even if you danced and sang beautifully, there was no guarantee of getting paid. The gypsy also noted to the girl that she had wonderful parents whom she should listen to. Little Zemfira promised that she would. Zemfira, the gypsy, hadn't been mistaken. Four months later, Ramona gave birth to a son, and they named him Flavio after her father. Nicholas was on cloud nine with happiness. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.